in the back? So, so? I, is that better? Okay, I'll just lean over more. Um, when I was asked to speak about uh, Western approaches to the prophet, I realized how stressful it is for me to speak about this topic, whether to a Muslim audience or a non-Muslim audience. Muslims are not, nor should they be, accustomed to hearing about the prophet uh, in a negative way, or hearing him spoke of negatively. But that's exactly how, uh, to one extent or another, he has always been portrayed in the West. I'll do my best, however, uh, to present this topic, counting on you to distinguish between what I'm reporting, other people having said, and what I'm saying myself. So I just want to make that very clear. I'm not saying these things myself. I'm reporting other people's uh, messages. The portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, in the West has varied greatly in the 1400 years since the beginning of Islam. Occasionally, we see extremes of ignorance and hatred. In the famous 12th century French epic, The Song of Roland, or Chanson de Roland, we find that some Western Christians believe that Muslims actually worship Muhammad as a god. Describing the encampment of the Muslim armies arrayed against the French, the poem reads, on the highest tower they raise an image of Muhammad, every one of the pagans prays to it and worships it. So this idea that actually Muhammad or Mahund is part of this uh, tr uh, weird trinity of God and then some other deity and then the, the prophet that, they act, that is actually worshipped by Muslims, of course. Um, I hope most of you know, or all of you know, that uh, Muslims don't worship the prophet. On the other hand, Europeans could be extremely well informed about the prophet's life and message. After the 1700s, European scholars had access to good translations of the Sirah, the life of the prophet, and other historical works that explain the details of the prophet's life. Edward Gibbon, an Englishman who in the 18th century wrote a history of the Roman Empire that is still very popular today, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I recommend this book. It's excellent. Three volumes, each one about 1,000 thousand pages. I finished one volume, working on the next one. Uh, he was better informed about the prophet than most professors of Islamic studies today. I'll say that. He knew that there was historical evidence that the Kaaba existed centuries before the beginning of Islam. He knew about the doctrine of abrogation of Quranic verses. He mentioned many miracles of the prophet, such as the tree stump longing for him. So there's when the prophet used to give, before the mosque was built in Medina, the prophet would give his uh, khutbahs, his Friday sermons, leaning on this uh, stump of a palm tree. And after the mosque was built, people would hear the, the, the stump Sort of actually making noise and yearning for the prophet's touch again. So this is a, a, you know, Edward Gibbon knew about all these stories. He knew about hadiths, reports about the prophet. He knew about the main authoritative hadith collections. And unlike many Muslims today, and unlike many media commentators today, he knew that there's a hadith that promised 72 heavenly beauties. People always say 72 virgins, 72, 72 heavenly beauties for every Muslim, not just martyrs. This is very important. We need to get this out on the street. Every Muslim gets 72 heavenly beauties. You don't have to be a martyr. Very important. There's not, not a lot of marginal benefit there. Right? For he knew that the prophet had mentioned that there were four, that there, he had specified four perfect women. Mary, Asiya, the wife of uh, Pharaoh, Fatima, and uh, the prophet's own wife, Khadija. In many of the varied depictions of the prophet in the West, however, we see consistent negative themes that frequently appear across the centuries. They are, one, that the prophet was an imposter and an opportunist. Two, that his message was stolen from other religions. It was not innovative or new. Three, that, and this is very important, that he was a lecher, that he was uh, sexually deviant in some way and, and lustful. And four, that he was a violent fanatic. These are four images and themes that appear constantly over and over again from the 700s until today. We see all, uh, many of these themes actually, or actually all of them, in the writings of John of Damascus. John of Damascus, he died in 749 of the Common Era. He was a, a Syriac Christian living in Damascus. And he uh, actually for many years of his life worked as an, as an administrator in the Muslim uh, caliphate for the Umayyad caliphs in Damascus. And later on in his life, he became a monk, and he retired to a monastery. He wrote many books about uh, Christian heresies, and 
one book called The Fount of Knowledge. In this book, he actually talks about Islam as a Christian heresy. And then he wrote another book called Disputa Disputations Between a Christian and a Saracen, between a Christian and a Muslim. So this is the, he's sort of the, the, the godfather of all uh, Christian polemics against Islam. Um, he wrote, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is a false prophet who by chance came across the Old and New Testaments and who also pretended that he encountered an Aryan monk and thus devised his own heresy. So John was claiming that the prophet plotted dishonestly to cobble Islam together from existing holy books, Jewish and Christian holy books. With John of Damascus, we also see the emergence of the idea that the prophet was a violent man, a man of the sword, and that this fact undermines the truth of his prophetic claim. Because, John says, true teachers like Jesus are men of peace and not men of war. It's important to remember that the, the way that um, most the Christian population of the Near East was first exposed to Islam was through the, the, the Muslim conquests, through Muslim conquests of their regions like Egypt, like Damascus, like uh, Iran and Iraq. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that um, you know, Muslims shed a great deal of blood in this area or forcibly converted people. I, I once told, I actually still do tell students, if they can find one instance of forced conversion in the first 300 years of Islam, I'll give them an A in class. One student actually found this once, but it was not really forced because it was a, a governor who was a rebel who did it, so I didn't count that. So he didn't get an A. But uh, he got, you know, added grade points for initiative. But I mean, this, this is, so, but, the, but the, the Christian population of the Near East were conquered. I mean, they were conquered, and they were then ruled by Muslim state. And that was, so this idea of, of Islam being a religion linked with violence and war was very clear to the Christian populations of the lands which the Muslims conquered. Stories of Muhammad's imposture and hypocrisy reach comic levels in the Chanson de Geste, which is a, a genre of popular tales told in medieval French from the 11th to the 13th centuries. Hildebert of Tours in the 11th century wrote a poem called Historia de Muhammad, the history of Muhammad, the most widely read medieval work on Islam, which was peppered with stories of the prophet as a drunken fool. It tells that he was buried in a temple with a coffin lid that was magnetic, or a coffin that was magnetically suspended to fool people into believing in him. So this idea that the prophet is uh, an imposter, that he's a charlatan, that he uses various ruses to convince people of the truth of his message. The story, uh, uh, later, another uh, sort of storyteller named Alexandre Dupont wrote a book called Roman de Mohammed in 1258, which is a French poem based on a Latin original, which shows the prophet as an imposter who uses uh, a dove eating, for, uh, sitting on his shoulder to convince people that he's receiving revelations from this dove. So what he would do is, supposedly, is he'd put bird f feed in his ear and then this dove would come and you know eat food out of his ear, and people would think that this dove was in fact you know whispering messages into his ear, uh, divine revelations. A 14th century English book of legends include an even, includes an even more fantastic story of imposture, of imposture, that the Prophet Muhammad started out as a Christian who wanted to become pope. When he realized there was no place for him in Rome. He made his way to Syria, where he bewitched the Arabs into believing that he was a prophet. In the 17th century, an English scholar, Humphrey Prudeau, wrote a book whose title gives you the sort of general idea he had about the prophet, The True Nature of Imposture, Imposture Fully Displayed in the Life of Muhammad. And that's old English, so there's all sorts of weird vowels and apostrophes and places like that in the title. It's also with John of Damascus that we see the first and, and sort of the, one of the most primary weapons used against uh, the prophet by critics of Islam and used to defame his reputation. And that's his marriage to Zainab. Now, this is something that actually happened, we, we know about it in the Quran. So the prophet uh, adopted a, a young man into his household. His name is Zaid ibn al-Haditha. Now, I have to remember that in, in Near Eastern tradition, so this goes from Rome to Egypt to ancient Mesopotamia, when you adopt somebody, they literally become your son, your child, as if genetically they're your child. So when uh, Octavian, or Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, later known as Augustus Caesar, when he went out to uh, 
fight the people who had killed Julius Caesar and assassinated him under the pretext that they had killed his father, even though he was just his adopted father. People believed this. This meant they, it was as if he had literally, his father had been murdered. Now, in Arab culture and in Jewish culture, you cannot marry the wife, the widow of your father. Or you, uh, a, a, and a son cannot marry, sorry, a father cannot marry a woman who was previously married to his son. So if you look at Jewish tradition in, in, the, in the ancient Mediterranean, in ancient Near East, you look at a Arabian culture, this is something that's, it's equivalent to incest. You can't, a, a father cannot marry someone to whom his son was previously married. A woman. Now, the, what happened was Zaid, the adopted son of the prophet, was married to a woman named Zainab. And they had, their marriage is having problems. And it, it, this was a particularly sensitive issue because the problem was that Zainab was really in love with the prophet, right? And the prophet encouraged them to stay together, but eventually the marriage became so uh, tempestuous and problematic that uh, he allowed them to be divorced. And then he married Zainab. This is very problematic. Uh, now, it was controversial during the life of the prophet. This is why the Quran diver devotes several uh, verses to this. Zaid is one of the two people mentioned in the Quran, contemporaries of the prophet, besides the prophet. Only two contemporaries of the prophet are actually mentioned by name in the Quran. One of them is one of his enemies, Abu Lahab, and the other one is Zaid. This is a very controversial issue. And what the Quran says is, it's okay for you to do this because an adopted son is not like a real son. And this is where we get in Islam the principle that adoption is never the same as a, a blood relation. You can adopt children. You can bring them into your family. You can take care of them. You can raise them. But they are never your child. They are always genetically different from you. And therefore, if they marry somebody and then divorce them, that person is, it's not as if your own child has married that person. So this, uh, so the, the prophet had, in fact, not uh, broken any taboo. But this is very controversial. The prophet was criticized by his uh, enemies and by his uh, people who wanted to discredit him for this action. Now, this th is then picked up as a central criticism of the prophet by uh, Christians and, and other non-Muslims who were writing polemics against Islam in the early Islamic period. So John, makes the, John of Damascus makes the accusation that Muhammad had fallen in love with his adopted son Zaid's wife, Zainab, had committed adultery with her, and then had manipulated the verses of the Quran to allow her divorce from Zaid and to allow him to marry her. John claims that the prophet's lust was so irrepressible that he used his false claims as a religious leader to justify them. So he's this idea that the prophet is literally unable to control his, his passions. The story of Zainab and the notion that the prophet used his religion to both possess women and also, in, the, in this case, commit adultery and, in cultural effect, incest, were repeated so many times in Christian sources that it defies counting. I mean, if you look at the amount of times this story is brought up by Christian uh, polemicists writing against Islam, whether in the Near East or in medieval Europe or in early modern Europe, literally it's just, it's over and over and over again. You, you could just list the authors endlessly. Just two examples here will suffice. There's a very interesting sort of mysterious 9th century Christian writing in Baghdad, an Arab Christian named Abd al-Masih al-Kindi, who cited this as a major objection to Islam's claims of prophethood. All the way in England in the 13th century, the historian Matthew of Paris noted that Muhammad used revelation to excuse an affair he had with a servant's wife. And so you can see this is also sort of a, another version of the Zaid story. It is really in the 1600s that Europeans started getting more reliable and fully colored pictures of the Prophet's life and mission. Sources like the Muslim biography of the Prophet and the chronicles of the Muslim historian Abu Fidla were translated into Latin and widely read by scholars. The Quran had been translated into Latin in 1143, but its translation was improved on and commentary added. In in 1647, it was translated into French for the first time, and in 16, 1734, the Quran was first translated into English. But the common and abiding stereotypes about the prophet continued. Edward Gibbon, as learned as he was, stated that the religion of Islam was, 
that the prophet, sorry, the religion that the prophet preached is, quote, compounded of an eternal truth and a necessary fiction. So the eternal truth is that there's only one God. Gibbon admits that. But the necessary fiction that Muhammad had to come up with is that he was the messenger of God. So he, this idea that even if you kind of respect Islam as a religion, the prophet is still a liar because he's not really a prophet, because Islam is not the true religion. Edward Gibbon noted that although the prophet was monogamous for his 25 years of marriage to his first wife, Khadijah, he was, quote, inclined to jealousy. And when he, when he fell in love with his adopted son's wife, Zainab, quote, the amorous prophet forgot the interest of his reputation. So here we see the image of the prophet as, again, uncontrollably lustful. The 19th century Swiss historian Jacob Burkhart wrote that the prophet, quote, stole scraps from other religions to compose his own message. He says that Muhammad was successful because he was, quote, personally very fanatical. And Burkhart then goes on to say that the victory of Islam in the Near East is a great victory of fanaticism. And that the prophet had made every sin forbidden except lying because lying he reserved for himself. This idea that the, the, the prophet is, is a liar. He's an imposter. Of course, we see these abiding stereotypes thriving in the West around us today. The Danish cartoon crisis of 2005-2006 was sparked in part by an image of the prophet with a turban packed full of bombs. In the 1988 novel, The Satanic Verses, Salman Rushdie's half-dream, half-polemical recreation of Mahund, his prophetic character's world in Mecca, was a den of purience and vice. Often we find vilification of the prophet coming from evangelical Christian leaders in the U.S. Pat Robertson stated on television that this man, and I quote, this man, Muhammad, was an absolute wide-eyed fanatic, a robber, a brigand, a brigand, and a killer. These terrorists, Robertson continued, Muslim terrorists, are carrying out Islam, and Islam is fraudulent, quote, a monumental scam, and a direct theft of Jewish theology. That was on Fox News. The Reverend Jerry Vines called Muhammad, quote, a demon-possessed pedophile who had 12 wives, and his last one was a nine-year-old girl. This last reference to a nine-year-old girl is, of course, referring to the prophet's marriage to Aisha. By Aisha's own testimony, and this is found in the most reliable, what's considered by Sunni Muslims to be the most reliable collections of, of reports about the prophet, she said that she was nine, between nine and 10 when the prophet consummated his marriage with her. So he actually signed, they actually agreed on the marriage when she was six, but uh, the marriage was consummated when she was between nine and 10 years old. This accusation of pedophilia has now replaced the Zainab incident as the proof of Muhammad's sexual deviation. It's a crime to fit our time. Of course, we have to remember that what constitutes appropriate ages for marriage or sexual intercourse are entirely conventional and, not, and based on the laws of cultures of specific states and peoples. There is no universal age of consent, if you look throughout history. It is thus no surprise that no critic of Islam or Muhammad brought up the Aisha's age until the 20th century. So you don't see anybody talk about, criticize the prophet for marrying Aisha and marrying a nine-year-old until, until relatively recently. It's the Zainab issue that is the big uh, if you want to look at sort of categorized criticism of the prophet, the sexual deviation ca uh, category, it's the Zainab issue that dominates that category. The Aisha issue is never brought up. There's one instance, Abdul Masih al-Kindi in the 9th century in Baghdad, he mentions Aisha's, the prophet's marriage to Aisha. But again, the criticism that the, that the prophet is uncontrollably lustful, because in the seerah of the prophet, the, tr the traditional biography told, uh, written about him by Muslims, he sees Aisha in a dream before he marries her. And he sees her dress in sort of gorgeous silk brocades and stuff. And the, the, Abdul Masih al-Kindi says, look, he's so infatuated with her that he's having these dreams about her. So the issue is that he's infatuated. The issue is not her age. The reason why we don't see this issue brought up is because marrying girls considered underage today was completely commonplace in the pre-modern world. Under Roman law, the earliest permitted age for marriage was 12. And in the heyday of the Roman Empire, let's say second century common era, by 14, a girl was considered an adult whose primary purpose was marriage. In many, many pre-modern law codes, such as Hebrew biblical law and Salic Frankish law, marriage age was not a question at all. 
It was assumed that when a girl reached puberty and was able to bear children, she was ready for marriage. And if you think about it, this sort of makes sense. I mean, why are we told to wait to get married or wait to have sex or wait to have kids? Well, you have to go to high school and you have to go to college and you have to get a job and you, know, you have to have all these things you're supposed to do. Well, these people didn't have any of that to do, right? If you live in the middle of the desert, there's literally nothing to do. I don't know if anyone's ever been into the desert. It's extremely boring, extremely boring. There's not, there's not anything to look at. Okay, there's no medical school, there's no law school. You might, you know, the second you hit puberty and you start having these urges, and for all the guys in the audience, you know what that's like, and all the girls in the audience, I assume there's some female equivalent, I'm not sure. But, I mean, the second you start entering this period of your life, if you don't have anything else to do, why not do that stuff? I mean, so I think it's very important to remember that a lot of the ideas we have about appropriateness for the idea of appropriate sexual activity or appropriate age for marriage doesn't really, it's, it's very, it's tied to our understanding of what people are supposed to do with their lives. As a result, historically, marriage ages tended to be very young in the pre-modern period. Data from several centuries of Ro imperial Roman history suggests that as many as 8% of women married at 10 or 11. In Italy, in the 1300s and 1400s, the average age for women getting married was 16 to 17. Even in an 1861 census in England, over 350 women married under the age of 15 in just two counties that year. I have to admit something. I am the product of an underage marriage. I was just looking through some family records. My aunt got this big batch of family records. My ancestor, Captain F.M. Smith, uh, from the first Texas Legion, he was on the wrong side of the Civil War. He was on the, well, I guess we're, we're in Virginia here. So he was on the, he fought in, in Texas. <laughs> He fought on the wrong side of the Civil War. So when he came back from the war, he saw this uh, girl playing in the yard of his friend, and she was six. He said, I want to marry her. And so he waited till she hit puberty, and then he got married to her. And that's, uh, but the good news is, this is very interesting, she applied for a Civil War veteran's pension in the 1920s. We have the, I was, one of the things I saw was her pension application because her husband, who was obviously a lot older than her, had just died. So I just discovered all this stuff about my family. Um, according to both Christian and Muslim teachings, the Virgin Mary was not the ma mature maternal figure we see in movies about the Bible. She was at most in her mid-teens when she gave birth to Jesus, having only just begun menstruating. And it is reported that she was as young as 10 years old. Muhammad's decision to consummate his marriage to a 10-year-old would have been based on the same criteria as most pre-modern societies, Aisha's sexual maturity and readiness to bear a child. Consummation of the marriage would have occurred when she had menstruated and started puberty. As the great Muslim historian Atabaris reported, quote, at the time of her marriage contract, Aisha was young and not capable of intercourse. Three or four years later, however, she was able. Aisha herself would later remark that a girl could menstruate as young as nine and be thus become a woman. And there's a, another interesting story, which I'll tell her. Uh, there's a famous Muslim jurist named Ashafi. He died in 820 of the Common Era. And one of his jobs was serving as a, as a judge in, uh, and a governor in Yemen, in Sana'a. And he tells that he saw something fascinating there. He saw a 21-year-old grandmother. A woman had menstruated when she was t 10, gotten married, immediately gotten pregnant, given birth to a daughter, menstruated when she was 10, immediately got married, had a, do had a child. So this, when he was in co a judge, he, he uh, adjudicated this issue, and this woman was a 21-year-old grandmother. So he gives us an example of sort of the full range of possibilities in human life. Beginning in the European Renaissance, however, we see a new, more positive theme emerging in the way that the prophet is portrayed in the West. The image of Muhammad is a brilliant state builder, who, is used, who used religion to forge a civilization. So the idea of someone who, who builds a civilization and he uses religion as a tool to do this. Of course, Western writers still assume that he was lying in his claims about prophecy, but his accomplishments were now admired. The famous English philosopher Thomas Hobbes used the prophet as an example of a, of a leader who used religion to empower the state, saying that he claimed to receive revelation from God in the form of, of a dove. So again, we have this dove image. The great histor French historian and satirist Voltaire affirmed that the prophet was, quote, a wise man amongst his people. 
He says he was skilled in science and an effective organizer. He admits that the prophet had many wives, but he adds that his need for love, quote, weakened neither his courage, initiative, nor his health. Voltaire defends polygamy as accepted in the cultures of the Near East, adding that the, that the prophet actually restricted the practice from its excesses, i.e. men who had hundreds of wives. So if you look in the Book of Kings, you see that Solomon has some 700 wives. So the prophet actually restricted this. In just three centuries, Voltaire adds, the Muslims, quote, put in motion by Muhammad, resembled the genius of the ancient Romans. Although Muslims did conquer the Middle East, Voltaire notes that neither the prophet nor the Muslims ever forced people to convert to Islam. In the writings of scholars like Voltaire, who are much more interested in criticizing corruption and the backwardness of the Catholic Church than insulting Muslims, Muhammad became an idealized alternative, a useful counter model to point out the flaws of Western institutions. It's very important to remember that when you when you read Voltaire's writing about Islam, he's not really writing about Islam, he's trying to criticize the Catholic Church and especially Jews. Voltaire did not like Jews very much, I don't think. And he uses the prophet as sort of an alternative, and the prophet's life as an alternative to the, to the Western religious institutions. The prophet had set out, Voltaire writes, to purge Arabia of Judaism, heretical Christianity, and idolatry in order to establish the worship of the one God. Unlike Catholics and Jews, Voltaire claims, the followers of Muhammad were open to knowledge and advanced far beyond Europe in their sciences. Even amongst these partial admirers of the prophet, however, we still find the belief that he was a liar who used religion falsely to achieve his ends. In part, this is inevitable among scholars and people who do not believe in Islam. If you don't believe that Muhammad was truly sent by God, then you must believe he was either insane or a liar. A fascinating alternative to this idea as of Muhammad as an imposter, however, is the idea that sincere prophethood is part of human history. We find this idea in the writings of the 19th century Scottish, Scottish historian and philosopher Thomas Carlyle. Carlyle saw history as the work of great men who represented and brought about the, the great stages of human history. He picks the prophet as the person who represented the shift from the great man as a god, for example, amongst the Greeks and the Vikings, to the great man as a prophet. Muhammad was a humble and frugal man, unlike the decadent Roman and Persian kings. Carlyle feels, oh, sorry, uh, far from being a liar, it is Muhammad's very sincerity that Carlyle finds so inspiring. He feels that sincerity is essential for a great man, and Muhammad was so sincere that he was not even conscious of how sincere he was. Quote, such a man is the very heart of truth, Carlyle writes. He cannot abide falsehood. He is so committed. Although Carlyle was never a Muslim, he admits that the prop. Uh, he admits that the Prophet's holy book was sincere and, ex and an expression of his greatness. Carlyle writes, quote, Really, his utterances, are they not a kind of revelation? What we must call such for want of some other word? Looking back on centuries of vicious attacks on the Prophet in the West, Carlyle states that calling him a liar or an imposter is, quote, disgraceful to ourselves only. Quote, the word that this man spoke has been the life guidance now of 180 millions, today 1.3 billion, of men these 1,200 years. Carlyle continues, are we, supposed to, are we to suppose that it was a miserable piece of spiritual leisure domain, this which so many creatures of the Almighty have lived and died by? The most interesting thing to me about the Western depictions of the prophet is how little they have changed in 1,400 years. Certainly, we do not find the absurdly ignorant idea that Muslims actually worship the Prophet as a god. But if you search the internet today for non-Muslim impressions of the Prophet, the themes of deception, lechery, extremism, and violence are still predominant. The good news is that the approach taken by Carlyle, namely to take the Prophet uh, seriously on his own terms, is becoming more popular. This is perhaps due to the decreased role of Christianity in academic discussions. When one is less committed to the exclusive truth of one religion, it is easier to admit that an influential le religious leader could have been sincere in his own religion. I hope that from this point on, we will stop holding the prophet accountable to norms that, although they seem sound and permanent to us today, have not been so in the past and are not so for others today. <laughs>